I am honored to have the privilege of introducing my friend, George. George and Julie came to the clergy pre-conference last year, and I do not think they knew what they were getting into. <laughs> um, we are so glad they did. They have added so much to our group. Uh, I, I left with a copy of George's book that I bought and a copy of George's book that he gave me. <laughs> and I gave them both away. And um, during the year, I, I, as I, I was reading, I had one particular chapter, and I sent George a message saying, this chapter alone was worth the price of the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I still believe that. So he has a new book available here, and he has words of wisdom to share. He has an interesting story. Um, I'm not going to risk stealing any of that thunder. Um, I'm just going to say we are, I am delighted that we get to spend the next block of time hearing from George. I want to move this because I tend to fidget and I will knock that over. So you can put the graphic up. So she actually um, didn't quite do justice for not knowing what I was getting into. Um, I came into the conference a um, liberal charismatic, which is rare these days. <laughs> uh, as uh, a few people told me by the end of the conference, um, one of the few they'd met that actually thinks like a normal person. Um, I actually stumbled into the conference not even knowing that it was put on by Lutherans. If you want to know the whole truth, I was supposed to go to the AACC conference and screwed up my booking, and they were completely full, and I couldn't go, and I wanted to go to a conference, so I actually, like someone else last night, Googled conferences on addiction and faith, and lo and behold, I came here, and um, didn't think to do any research other than that, and so anyways, showed up came to the early event and found out I was with a bunch of Lutherans. I didn't even know what a Lutheran was. So there's that. Anyways, no, man, I am so excited to be here. I am um, truly honored to be part of this event because last year um, changed my life forever. You see... Was it, was it in this exact room, or was it in the room right here? So I think it was, if I get this correct, it was right about, right about here that I had a public breakdown. So much so that Dr. Q English, the speaker at the time, came down off the stage and began to hug me as I began to sob. And that moment changed me forever. You see, much like the Israelites, we, we spend an eternity trying to get into the promised land. And when we do, we often think of the promised land as something um, that it's not. We think of it as easy. We think it of, as the land of milk and honey, we think of it as um, no struggle, no strife. You see, I'm a person in long-term recovery. I have been in recovery for 19 years. I've been what we would call sober for 17 of those years. I have been a full-time missionary for the entire 17 years. I have been a recovery founder. I am a pastor. I'm a coach, counselor, speaker, consultant. I do all of these things. But sometimes we forget that at the heart of it all, we're human beings. And we're human beings with a story. 
And we're human beings that often come with a story that has a lot of pain and trauma. And that pain and trauma, when not healed, and when not understood, leads us to public breakdowns in front of a bunch of Lutherans that we never knew. <laughs> For real. Hmm? There's no safer place. No safer place. This is true. This is true. Um, Yo, know, thank you all for being here. Let me just tell you this, that you have an opportunity at this conference to awaken yourself to a new way of seeing things. See, when I walked down these stairs just a few minutes ago, I was re reminded of the fact that often we live our lives only being able to see what's right in front of us. And when we only see what's right in front of us, we can't take the time to actually step and rise above everything and see the different things that might be happening. And so, how many of you in this room are in recovery? Can I see with a show of hands? Now, since it's early in the morning, let's get some calisthenics going. Let's everybody put your hands up. Pentecostal. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise to Jesus. Now, in my opinion, all of those hands up, all of you are in recovery. You see mistake that has been made is we tend to think of recovery as only for the drug addict, only for the alcoholic, only for the person with mental health issues. But the reality is I don't think we want to be associated with being the alcoholic, the drug addict, or the mental health, mental health case that everybody has to worry about. So we stuff down all the issues that we may actually have. Or we, 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 we do this thing that Richard Rohr calls the, um, it basically the, the community comes around and says, these ones are okay. The, these, these things are okay. So I can be a workaholic because it's okay, right? I can, I can you know, avoid, you know, direct confrontation or interactions with others because, well, I'm a busy, important person, and that's okay publicly, right? So as a, as, a, as a community, when everybody says it's okay to try to make as much money and make as, have as many possessions and live a life for yourself and that's okay, then you'll do that. But those aren't really healthy behaviors now, are they? And so we don't need recovery because I'm not the bum on the corner with the bottle. I go to work, right? Um, I don't even drink. But would your, would your children say you're present? Would your wife, your husband say you're present? Would, would people around you say they actually know you? And truthfully, if you look in the mirror, do you know you? Because I think we all have this decision to make. And I think that um, it's, a, it's a tough one. Martin Luther King says we should all write our own obituary at least once, right? Maybe more. What do, you, what do you want your, your gravestone to say? What do, you, what do you want your obituary to say? Who do you want to be, you know, when it all ends? What life do you want to have lived when it all ends? It's interesting when we think of scripture and we think of, you know, what actually happens um, early in Genesis. And what's kind of funny is, I never really actually hear anybody talk about original sin, but this over the last few days it's came up like three or four times, which I found kind of ironic because I never actually think of original sin. But I do think about this. There's this, I don't know if you're Christian, all, everyone here is Christian or not, but even if you're not, maybe you've heard the story, but you know that there's this, these people in the Bible, Adam and Eve, and there's this interesting part in Genesis, Genesis 3.11, I believe, where... God is in the garden and he's looking for them and he had been fellowshipping with them and he, and he can't find them anywhere and he, God is like, where are you? Right? And, and then and Adam and Eve are basically, well, we're, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? Well, because we're naked. And God says this interesting thing. He says, who told you you were naked? A couple years ago, I had this revelation. Who told you you were a drug addict? Who told you you were worthless? 
Who told you you were crazy? Who told you you didn't deserve to have a life? Who told you you were less than everyone else? Who told you these things? Because it wasn't God. See, God, in Jeremiah, before the foundations of the world, said something interesting. He said we were wholly perfect and blameless. It doesn't line up with how the world sees us. Worse yet, how we see ourselves. And that's problematic, right? But we have to go back a few more passages, a few passages earlier, and that's where, you know, the, the serpent is talking to Eve and, and says, you know, did God really say, you know, you die, right? Because if you actually eat of the tree, you'll be like God. And I don't know if it's the original sin. I think that's a ridiculous debate anyways. I will say this. I think it's problematic when we want to be like God. But I think that is carried over as a sort of curse, as we want to be like God. Now here's the thing. I think there's some truth in the fact that when we ate of that tree, we could become like God. Free to judge and decide what is good and evil for ourselves, But we don't have the wisdom of God. And without the wisdom of God, all we do is heap shame upon people. Deciding what is good, what is bad, is not our role. Judging one another is not our role. But I will tell you as clear as I stand here today, the recovery system is broken and we judge one another in it. To sit here today and say we got it figured out would be a lie. Eight of 10 fail. Two of 10 make it a year. Right? We know this. It's pretty common. Then that two of the ten that make it, what's interesting is we see this weird thing happen where two of ten make it a year, but you ever wonder how many of those make it to two years? And it's only like 30 to 40 percent, depending on which statistical thing you use. But what's interesting to me has always been the fact that those that make it to three, 80% go to five and 10 years. So what the hell happens in between then? Right? That's the question we should be asking. But because of the insurance system, we decided recovery should be 30, 60, 90, six months long because insurance had to figure out how much they would pay for a long time ago. And I get that, it's a, it's, a, it's a business. But true recovery is a lifelong process. It's a journey, right? It's this journey into becoming who God created us to be. It is this journey into living out our destiny that God has placed upon us. And it is a journey that we're supposed to go through with one another. But the way that the world has built it is that we, we get shipped off to a recovery program. We get shipped off to jail. And I do know that there are judges that are doing good things. And it is not simply a punitive system. I realize this. I work with the court system. But the reality is that the world believes that if you're in addiction, you should be anonymous. It's not our problem. And you should be amongst other addicts. Because we've told them that's what we should be. We've told them that. I don't think we can find true recovery, true freedom, true fulfillment, a true life, one that I can look back on and say, I've lived the life I want to live if I'm only with drug addicts and alcoholics. I think I have to be amongst people. I'm anonymous no more, baby. I'm coming at you recovering loudly for the world to see. But that's how we should all be. You see, 
when I think of why you should even listen to me, and I don't even know if this is the right reason, but I will tell you that for the last 17 years of my life, I have lived in intentional recovery community amongst people that are coming off of heroin, homelessness, schizophrenia, bipolar, suicidal thoughts. I live in the inner city of Ybor City, Tampa, Florida with my wife, amongst the poor. We've lived there in that home for 12 years. I mean, put it this way, as we came here uh, this week, we had to make a decision to let a, a woman that we've known for years, who's a, a prostitute, who has mental challenges, whose husband, who may or may not be her pimp, had got locked up, who may or may not be a big time drug dealer. Um, she was, you know, frantic because even though those are the bad things he does, he's her security and she had nowhere. And so she's at our house and we're about to leave town and we're like, do we let her stay here when we're gone or not? And she's staying in our house right now. So we really live this out. And so I'm not coming at you because I have a, a lot of college degrees, although I have some. I'm certified in addiction and trauma. I mean, I have that. But I don't think you should listen to me because of that. If you want to listen to me, it should be because my life has stood for something more. It has stood for walking with people day in and day out. See, the problem with counseling or sponsorship is it's an hour long of a week. But when you live with people 24-7, seven days a week, you tend to see all the things that happen in a person's life. You tend to you tend to recognize all the decisions that a person makes in their life, whether they're good or they're bad, and how they impact the future. I want to give my friend Barry Lehman a, another shout out. He's had like three this week, so I think he gets an MVP. But, but Barry, um, in his Master in Recovery, um, called me a few months back and said, I'd like to talk to you about your thoughts on long-term recovery and how you do it. And so I just started telling him some of our philosophies. And maybe he was just being kind to me, but he said, this is incredible. I have never heard anything like this in my life. He's like, this is mind-blowing that I've been in working for the Mayo Clinic, working in recovery, and I've never thought of these things. But it's because of the way that we've looked at recovery for so long, and that is it's all like, now those of us in long-term recovery, and I'm in long-term recovery, we tend to recognize it as a journey, but I'm, I'm talking about it from the way the society looks at it, and that is that it's a short-term thing, and you should get yourself right, and after that, don't be a nuisance to me, right? You, you went through your damn program, and you go to your stupid meetings, now don't be a nuisance to me, act like a regular person. That's what society wants. But the reality is, the brain, which is a beautiful, marvelous, spectacular thing, can do some pretty crazy stuff. And a lot of things can impact that brain. Things like limbic lag, right? And trauma that we go through as children. And I'm going to go into that full force in a few minutes. But what's really powerful about the brain is it can heal. It can heal. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with, worked with or lived with or been around a, someone who's a long-term meth head. But man, when you, when you talk about working with addicts, there's different ways in which they all behave. But when I'm working with, in particular, people with meth addiction, long-term meth addiction, you really feel like there's no way this person's coming back. I mean, they could be three months sober and still seeing shadows. I'm still talking to people that are in the attic when there's not even an attic. But if you stick it out with them long enough, their brain can heal. I think uh, the National Society for Recovery says that the brain can heal on average between three to seven years from anything. So we know if we're willing to put in the time and the effort, it can heal. So, for me, 
I think of Jesus and I think of the time he spent with the disciples. Interestingly enough, it was also three years. And so when we're willing to put this time in with people, you know, it's amazing that we can actually see results. I should probably start my talk now. So hold on, let me see where I'm at. Everybody doing okay out there? Sorry, I can become a little intense sometimes. Didn't mean that. So, all right. All right, let's loosen up a little bit. I'm talking to myself here. I still have issues. So, what we don't want, right? We don't want those that have succeeded in recovery to be the thing that prevents future generations from long-term recovery. And it goes back to that tree. And it goes back to that judgment. Because let me tell you something. It's interesting getting around recovery people because they all have different thoughts on what's right and what's wrong. And you'd think that like we would come together and say, listen, we're the, we should be together on this side. But you can have different AA groups and you can have one over here that says it's okay to use you know, harm reduction and you can have another over here that says if you're drinking Red Bull, you're not even sober because it's mind altering. For real. It's like that different. So, you, you know, I was talking once again to, to Barry last night, and I was like, you got your 12 steps, you got the big book, you got your sponsor, you got your home group. And any one of those things can have a different interpretation, right? You could have a sponsor that thinks certain things, you could have a home group that stands by certain principles. You got the 12 steps that can be interpreted in a certain way. And so it's complicated when we can't all get on the same page, which is like, what does it mean to be in recovery? What does it mean to live a recovered life? What does it mean to be your authentic self and what's preventing that from happening? And so I loved the man's talk last night. The, the first, I loved both talks. Christina was amazing and, and he was amazing. But it, it reminded me, like when he said, he goes, when you come into Hazleton, it's like right on the wall, there's the 12 steps, right? And I think that's great. But part of the problem is what if it doesn't work for people? And, we, and it goes back to the shame cycle, okay? And we have to understand the shame cycle is a very powerful thing. I believe that shame is the closest thing to being in hell that you can have in this life. Shame is a powerful, powerful emotion that will keep us bound. And when you look at the 12 steps and you, and you have a question as to, I have all this pain inside of me. Nowhere does it talk about what happened to you to end up here. Bessel van der Kook in, in um, his book, The Body Keeps the Score, which is an amazing resource. If you haven't read it, highly recommend you read that book. But he's like, pain is the motivator to all behavior that ironically causes more pain. And so when I looked at recovery, now we have so many people that it is hugely successful for the 12 steps and that's Amen. I think we should use everything under the sun to help a person live another day. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart because let me tell you something. I am a suicide survivor. Um, I've attempted suicide six times. And I truly still have suicidal thoughts to this day. I was a drug addict, alcoholic. I was all the things that you typically would think of as a person that needed recovery really bad. But I found in my journey that it did matter that I was sexually abused, okay? It did matter that I was physically and psychologically abused. It did matter that I grew up in a household that as you see in that test on there, the, on your desk or your table here, the ACEs test, which we'll get into in just a minute, just to give you a heads up, I score a nine out of 10, okay? I, it did matter that I'd been through those things. And it matters when another person has been through those things. 
Anybody here use ChatGPT? You don't know what ChatGPT is? What's going on in Minnesota? You guys have internet here? <laughs> Do you guys Wi-Fi? <laughs> a, a, a modem? Anything? You guys don't know what ChatGPT is? Do any of you? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure. Uh, not. You know that like the computers, they can like they can make deep fakes, they can make all kinds of amazing things on the internet now, they can do all kinds of things with um, software. <laughs> AI, thank you. The world is changing at, at a miraculous rate, okay? My point is, the world is changing at this rate and recovery has got to catch up, okay? When, when we think of what is happening in recovery, what worked all those years ago, we just now have so many more tools at our disposal. So many more things that we can use in order to help people find a life that they did not think they could have. I mean, it's interesting because when we, we think of many years ago, they searched for the alcohol gene that they thought they could prove that if you could, there was a gene that a person had, and they couldn't, they couldn't find that. We know that genetic, genetic predisposal, you know, a person can be more likely for something, but they, they couldn't find like a particular thing. Now, if I told you that I could take your 12-year-old child and predict within 700% whether or not they were gonna become a drug addict or an alcoholic, wouldn't you want to know? And if you are a person who struggled with addiction, and I could tell you within a 700% reasoning of why you became that, wouldn't you want to know? If I could tell you what children under the age of 18, which ones were 1,200% more likely to attempt suicide, wouldn't you want to know? That's not hypothetical. You can respond. Wouldn't you want to know? Yeah? But we can. We can tell. See, the adverse childhood experiences test can predict those things within those ratios. And it's been around for 23 years. Actually, a few years longer, it came out in 97. I think the test was between what we decide, 96 and 98. And then... Yeah, 96 and 98. And so now we know within all these percentages that if you have what's on your desk there, you table there, I keep saying desk, I don't know why, your table, you have the adverse childhood experience test. 10 simple questions. If you score four or higher, then you fall into the range of being 700% more likely to become a drug addict, alcoholic, or have social conditions that are unhealthy, or 1,200% more likely to attempt suicide. That's powerful. Now, I brought up all the AI and ChatGPT. It kind of fell flat since we're in Minnesota and nobody has internet. Um, it would have been so much more powerful if everybody was like, oh yeah, woo! It's, uh, Live and learn, right? <laughs> um, but the reason I brought all that up is because they have MRI scans and, and we can scan the brain and we can see in the brain that these things are actually affecting the brain. Okay, that, that's what I was, that was my big punchline. Got to come up with another one. But, so in Pinellas County, they already adopted ACE training for family court system. In the Hillsborough County, which is one of the largest counties um, in the state of Florida, um, I've been asked, I was asked to present to all of the family court judges um, an ACE presentation as part of a day-long seminar that went through why family court judges need to introduce ACE training into its decision-making when deciding what families should be together, what they should do with their families moving forward, and how they should proceed with families that um, are struggling with these things. And we, we have this, you know, this all-day seminar, and all these judges and 
that was a tough crowd, almost as tough to, as today. But, you know, um, but those judges all received it so well that now we're waiting on the time frame, but I'm hopefully going to be going up to the state capitol, speaking to the state legislator, and attempting to get all the family court systems in the state of Florida to adopt ACE training into its decision-making process when figuring out how to reunite families or make decisions on families. It's that important. But recovery still doesn't really adopt this into how we should recover. And that saddens me because a few years back, I came to the awareness, and, and I should stop, and I meant to say this in the very beginning. I brought up the story of the tree and the judgment because I think that it's easy to forget that we're all different people experiencing different things. And so some of you may be sitting there right now, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, we do this. Well, maybe you do, okay? Um, I heard a few of you last night mention the ACE training in the things that you do, and that's great. I'm not saying exhaustively that no AA group talks about prior trauma. I'm not saying exhaustively that every recovery place doesn't use this. Please don't hear what I'm, I'm not saying. I'm just saying as a whole, we have room to grow in understanding the whole person's story. Okay, that's all. So before the daggers come out and the microphone questions start coming, um, we could just grow in this area. So part of my journey has been starting a drug and alcohol, I call it a program here because it helps you to understand what I'm talking about, but we never called it a program. In fact, I had to work very hard to not call it a program because I believe in the term community. And so in 2009, I started a program for men in Tampa called the Timothy Initiative. And it became four houses, houses 40 men, and it did some things a little bit different. One of which is it's open-ended. Why open-ended? Because like I said before, to heal the brain, to make better decisions, to live a life of transformation is different than graduating from a program which is six months and now move on and go find a life. But here's the interesting thing, is that over the last however many years, I've worked with over a thousand people. And I can tell you that the people, the men in the Timothy Initiative, 80% of the men that come through those doors make it to multiple years of sobriety. 80%. It's unheard of. I don't know, if, and I don't say this boastfully, but I don't know of anywhere else in the world that can actually say that. Not with the amount of people that we've had come through the doors. Maybe there's like a, a small program, but we have... Uh, a ratio of 80% that make it to long-term recovery, and I mean over three years by that. I have a crew of guys that um, live in my intentional community in Ybor City with us, not in the Timothy Initiative, but my wife and I live in what we call intentional community. Um, we live, I think we have 13 or so people on our property, um, husbands, wives, children, um, plus people that come in and out, like the woman I mentioned before. We've done this for many years. Um, and out of those men, there, you know, I have a core of like four guys around me that are all nine years sober from heroin addiction. Nine years from being in and out of every 12-step, every recovery place. They, part of what was interesting about the Timothy Initiative is we only take people that have been kicked out of every drug program there is. Because we only want those that are the worst of the worst, those that have no one. Because interestingly enough, often when people have family and resources, that tends to be the one thing that's holding them back from reaching a life of fulfillment. So we, you know, our interview process was pretty simple. Do you have anywhere to go ever? Then maybe we can take you. But if you have somewhere to go, then we want to reunite you with, with that family, right? But we take those that have nowhere to go because we want to build a community of people. And I, you know, I, honestly, I originally started it because 
I wanted to have a community of people around me to go through life with. Because I never felt like I fit in in any church. I didn't feel like I fit in in any drug program. I saw things so differently. I saw, you know, I saw the world differently and I didn't feel welcome anywhere. And so I'm like, I'll just start my own thing. And I just started taking in guys from the street and just said, you know, let's do life together. Let's celebrate life. Let's go through the ups and the downs, the good and the bad. And at least we, we have each other. And it grew into this just this beautiful, beautiful thing, which, um, to be honest, I, you know, for the longest time was like, I can't figure out. We don't have very good systems. I don't really know what I'm doing. I, you know, why is this working? And, and, it, and it really became apparent that it's because if you tell a person they're worth something and that they have a voice and that they, they can be part of something, that really goes a long way. It really goes a really long way. And most of the time we come into pro, you know, programs and I think most programs mean the best, but they, it's about a checklist of things you need to do before you're, you're worth anything. And, and the bottom line is it's like that's the very same logic that kept most of us out there. I need to know I'm worth something when I'm at my worst. I need to know you, you can love me when I'm at my worst. And so we adopted some insane policies, man. We don't kick people out when they relapse. Find a drug program that can say that. We don't charge anybody either, by the way. So, I mean, it was just like, we're going to come together, we're going to do this thing called Life Together, we're called the Timothy Initiative because it was meant to be like Paul and Timothy where we just do life with each other. Paul did not teach Timothy like this. He taught Timothy like this. Right? My beloved servant, right? He, what does Paul say in, in Corinthians 4? He says something along the lines of like, all of you have fathers, but not many of you have spiritual fathers. We need to be spiritual fathers to the world. Show people the love and acceptance of the Father's heart. So, that's what we became. And then, I just remember around year three, Three, being like, everybody's still here. How is this even possible? It's the same guys. It's like, just became insane to me that people would come in and, and no matter who you took a chance on, you know, you got the few that are just, you know, mentally just got other challenges or other things. They're not being honest when they check in and they, what they really want to do is get together with their girlfriend or whatever. But we had some pretty crazy policies, you know. I didn't, you know, we didn't let anybody date for a couple of years because let's just face it, brand new in recovery, you have no business dating. So, um, I, you know, we did just things like that. We're like, we're going to be together 24-7. We're going we're gonna to do this thing called Life Together. And if you don't want to do that, and you want to go find life outside of this community, then you, sh you can't be part of this community, right? And so it just became this amazing, amazing thing. And, um, you know, much like I said before, it's like, but then, you know, life happens sometimes. And 2018 rolled around. And for whatever reason, in 2018, I lost seven people to suicide. We lost two in one week. Um, not necessarily men in the program, but men, you know, one lost his sister, another one lost his brother. One of my board members, um, his son, who was like a son to me, he was my best friend. Um, he jumped from the Skyway Bridge, 24 years old, amazing kid that, um, I just don't have words for it, right? Five days earlier, one of my close friends had hung herself. Julie and I, my wife, my amazing wife, um, you know, having to go to two memorials on the same day for suicide. And it was, you know, interesting how we don't, in recovery, always tell our whole story. And, and at that point, I'd always talked about my addiction and never really talked about my suicide attempts. And, and I felt like God like finally say, now it's time. 
now it's time. And so I went public for the first time with my six suicide attempts and my constant nagging of wanting to die by suicide or feeling that I was going to die by suicide. And um, I'm just an activist at heart. So I have all these leaders that are running TI that have got all these years. I've raised them up. So I decided to, to start the Sober Truth Project, which the Sober Truth Project to me is just, um, we seek to educate, empower, and equip people to understand a better way to walk through addiction, mental health, and suicidal thoughts together. Utilizing an online platform and podcast and interviews and public speaking and coaching to achieve this. And honestly, it's, when I met Ed last year, I was like, we say the exact same things to, to people. It's very similar to the center of addiction and faith. And who knows, one day maybe we'll merge because it's really the same, it's the same purpose, right? We're called the, the way I say it is that we want to educate and equip and empower people in recovery from addiction, mental health issues, and suicidal thoughts, but we also want to um, help people call to love, lead, and lead people in recovery from addiction, mental health, and suicidal thoughts. And believe it or not, most people find themselves in one of those two categories, right? And so starting the Sober Truth Project, and then, you know, a couple years later, writing the book, The Uncovery, which is right over there in the uncovery. It talks about all these stories that I'm, I'm kind of sharing with you. It's, it's more than just a book, though. It's a, it's a method of, you know, living out life and restoration. It's by diving deep into the pain and the issues that have led people astray that we can re start rebuilding a person destined for greatness, rooted in an identity in God. And, you know, the uncovery tries to utilize all of their life experiences, the pain, the problems in the past is raw material to forge a, you know, a future filled with hope and fulfillment. And you can get your copy right over there on the left-hand side, right-hand side if you're sitting on this side of the room. Don't make it, please don't make me carry it back on the airplane. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it's just a different way of looking at things. Um, and I, I do realize, right, that I'm saying all these things up here today and I had all these notes, and I, I haven't looked at them at all, because it's just my heart, and I just want you to hear my heart, right, that we can do things better if we understand the whole person, if we can understand that childhood experiences do matter. Every child comes into this world as a, as a, um, a beautiful, living human with potential, but then when they don't get unconditional acceptance, when they have to work to be noticed, when they don't have the freedom to experience all emotions, when they don't have a mother to mirror their feelings and emotions to say that you've been seen, somehow along the way, things go wrong. You see, the, the limbic system is with us from the moment we come into this world. The neocortex develops later. But the limbic system associates, associates a meaning and a feeling to everything that happens. The neocortex comes along later and, and, and tells us what something means. But when that's screwed up, we don't know what things mean. And so we tend to just you know, attribute emotions to things that are incorrect. And we don't necessarily know how to be at home within ourselves. And that's really what it comes down to. It's like, when I think of like, what the future of recovery looks like for the world, and, and in some way we have to learn how to be, um, to work with the central nervous system, right? to be able to regulate our internal systems. Because when we're in addiction or we struggle with mental health, we don't know how to regulate our internal systems. We tend to have to use outside things in order to regulate those internal systems. And we, we have to figure that out, whether it's through mindfulness or deep breathing or centering prayer or all of these things that can help us to heal the internal mind that we have damaged so much, either in our early childhood 
or through our addiction and through all of the struggles that we've had. Because when we think of what addiction or mental health issues really are, they're just this lack of connection, right? It's just this brokenness and it's a search for a connection that we just have not been able to find. So I feel ill-equipped to try to compete with Johan Hari, who spoke last year. I'm like, Johan Hari, George Wood. It's, I think I'll, I'll go with Johan Hari. But he talks about it and he says that, you know, connection is the opposite of addiction. And it, and it really is. And, and how do we begin to build healthy connection with one another? And we can only do that through, um, the way I put it, is authentic, true community with one another. Where we are all being um, open and honest with each other. When we feel pain that we think we deserve, isolation only magnifies that. It only magnifies that. And when we put a bunch of energy and effort into getting right and doing right and living different, but then fail, and we don't have people to come around us, that only reinforces that we're not worth anything. Behavior modification is a good thing when the healing has taken place. But if the healing hasn't taken place, behavior modification is incredibly dangerous because it reinforces that you were never worth anything to begin with. So act right, behave right. And that's dangerous to a guy who's been locked into a closet naked with no food for three days, like my friend Mike. When I think of the, it's interesting because you think of Mike and his story, you know that he was a drug addict and he, and he overdosed and was in a coma for months and then had to teach himself how to walk and talk and all that type of stuff. And then the moment he walked out of that hospital, he still had the IV pick in his arm and he went and got high right away. It's real easy, really easy to take that position of God in his life and say he deserves it. It's just choice, right? What kind of a guy does that? Lost his daughter to the, to the court system. Nobody knows about the abuse. Nobody knows about being locked in that closet and have to pee himself because it was a tiny closet and he wasn't allowed out. Nobody knows about the stepfather that, you know, when Mike ate one of his Oreos, took the rest of the Oreos and stomped them into the floor mat and then Mike made Mike eat them off of it. Who he knows that. Mike's just a junkie. I can tell you this, that every person in deep addiction has been through similar stories. There's trauma in every person that's been in hardcore addiction. They may not even know it yet. A friend of mine, just over the last few days, said, you know, I've been in sobriety for 20-some years, and I'm just now realizing I need to heal from the things my mother did to me. This is my question. It's like, maybe you don't use drugs and alcohol for all these years, but are you really free if you still haven't healed from that trauma? I want to be free. I want to be healed. I want to be authentic. I want to be who I am in God's eyes, and I don't want to just not use drugs and alcohol. I don't. That's a subset of it. And if I, even if I did use them again, does it, what, what, are, what are we working towards here? Time? Time's the construct. Freedom is a feeling, it's an emotion, it's a lifestyle, it's transformation. That's what I want for people. Every person I work for from this day forward and has been for a while now, it's like, what made you start to use? What was happening in your life? What pain was happening? That's way more important to me than what sins you've committed since you used. I don't... And I know that, you know, a lot of things can be good intentions, but I know that everybody in here that's in recovery knows that they've lost people after the fourth and fifth step. And then we say stuff like, well, they just weren't constitutionally capable of doing it. That's bullcrap, man. Maybe they went through hell. And you're telling a person who was on a battlefield 
They need to just suck it up. No, I just don't, I don't buy that, man. And I don't buy it because it hasn't worked in the lives of the people that I have transformed, that I have seen transformed. And I'm going to tell you a story, and it's a personal story, and I asked my wife ahead of time for forgiveness because I didn't get her okay. This is why the ACE test is so important to everybody, even those of you in long-term recovery. Here we go. 13 years ago, I was dating my now wife. She's an amazing woman of God. She is all about sacrifice and the kingdom, laying down her life, giving everything to the people she serves. We had some friends introduce us and bring us together. They're like, you two would be an amazing couple. You would, you would do so much for the kingdom of God. And so we began to date. And we dated for a while, and then I just felt like I just couldn't do it. And so I ended the relationship. I ended the relationship because I felt like she's this amazing woman, and I'm just going to cheat on her. I have a lot of sexual dysfunction. I, I, I just was not, I was trying to be the bigger person. Right? I was trying to be like, I am not going to put this person through that. So I ended the relationship. I don't think I knew things as clear at that point, but I just knew it wasn't right. And so a couple months later, I was actually working with someone who was a sex addict, and I was taking him through, ironically, um, some step work and, and, and things of that nature. And I, he started telling me this thing that happened with him and his uncle. And, uh, and I was like, so you were sexually abused? And he's like, no, that wasn't sexual abuse. He was my uncle. He was just, you know. And he sat there for a second and he goes, oh, wow. That, that was sexual abuse, wasn't it? And I was like, yeah, man, I can't believe you can't see that. Jeez. I didn't say it quite like that, but. Um, and, you know, whatever, end of the meeting. And um, I felt like God just bring to my mind. He's like, hey, that thing that happened with your father's girlfriend. I'd never considered this. But when I was 12 years old, my father, who was passed out, um, his girlfriend climbed into bed with me and had sex with me. In my mind, my family was really screwed up. You see, when I was in first grade, my father left my mother for another woman and um, moved to Florida, and I was in upstate New York, and my, you know, my older brother went with him, and my older brother the following year died on a construction accident my father was the GC of. So it destroyed my father. He went into addiction, never came out necessarily. And uh, so he was never really present. So I just sort of was always taught that a man sleeps with women, as many as he can. And so when my father's girlfriend did this, even though I was 12, I didn't put two and two together that, that was sexual abuse. But once I was finally able to do that, I was able to then unravel all of the sexual issues I had. I was able to say, this is the precursor to the other sexual dysfunctions that I have. And I was able to receive healing from that. And I was able to begin to understand myself as not just a lech that was going to cheat on this amazing woman, but I was instead a man who could heal from something that had happened to him and begin to reframe the way I seen the world, the way I seen myself, and more importantly, the way I seen women. And I was able to come back together and marry my wife. And we've been married now 
12 years next week. <laughs> Understanding your past trauma helps you understand the things that you do, right? I don't know if I'll fully ever recover from all of the trauma that I've been through, but I know a little bit each time, right? I had been in sobriety for two years, and my sister, who is in addiction, um, I tried to help, and she got into rehab, and she left the rehab, and I told my mother not to help her because she, you know, she left. She's not constitutionally okay. She can't do it. I use the saying. She died from a drug overdose shortly thereafter. Six months later, I'm thinking I need to do something more. I'm about to start that ministry I told you about, the Timothy Initiative, because my sister died and I need to do something more. My brother, also an addiction, graduated from Harvard Law School, partner at one of the biggest law firms in Tampa. So before you think of an addict like we all do, it's just guys on the streets. Um, he left the rehab. I hadn't learned my lesson just yet, so I told my mother to cut him off. My brother died from a drug overdose. So. My sister and my brother die from drug overdoses seven months apart. Um, so, if anything, I want my authenticity with you to say, maybe you'll give me a pass on some of the things you disagree with that I've said. But I can promise you that everything I say comes from a life that lives this every single day. If we can begin to look at recovery through a lens of what happened to a person, we can begin to understand what they're going through. We can create a more loving and empathetic society. And so ultimately, what are we trying to do here? We gotta think of it in these terms. Are we trying to just get a person that's in addiction to not be in addiction anymore? That's one way. Or do we want to stop future generations from being in addiction? Because I think if we look at the ACE test that's on your table, we can begin to look at how we raise our children, how we see other people raise their children, how the family court system works. We can see the things that may be 700% driving them towards addiction and begin to get them the healing and counseling before they end up there. We can begin to um, look at a person's life that ends up, you know, being suicidal and not being like, geez, I had no idea. But you can look at the ACE test and be like, has this person been through these things? Because that makes them more likely to be through these things. And, and, and I say this from the bottom of my heart. We have to recognize we have all eaten of that tree. And we want to judge but if we can take a step back and say we don't have the wisdom of God and we're not free to judge, we can begin to see that if we're more open and receptive to understanding other people's views and what other people have went through, we can begin to create that more loving and empathetic society. And it's only through that that we can truly begin to make a change. I think that... Um, you know, I'll end with this, but um, in Ephesians, you know, Paul, writing from prison, says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. If we could bear with one another, 
be loving to one another, being humble, we can begin to see the world in a different way. My new book, The Uncovery Devotional, is there. It's 365 days of entries that are everything I know about mental health, addiction, suicidal thoughts, trauma, and faith. I hope you'll pick up a copy. It doesn't even come out until October 31st, but I was able to get some here. It's not your typical devotional that just rephrases what other people have written before. It is a deeper dive into the topics that I think can really change the world. Everyone, thank you. I think they're going to have some questions, so please don't make them hard. Don't make me do. <laughs> don't 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 make me do what Christina did last night and not just be like, I'm actually not going to answer them. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, George. <laughs> that, was, that was beautiful. Thank you so much for being so real with us. Um, so I understand that you're a charismatic and you got saved by the Lutherans? Is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have to say, I'm actually teaching a class on Lutheran theology and recovery every Thursday night for the next six weeks back at the Lutheran church back home. How crazy is that? Uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. I'm... <laughs> All right, questions for George. Easy ones. Easy ones. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, I'm Joy Gonerman. I'm a pastor and I'm a certified prevention specialist. So for all of each, each of these ACEs, there's a protective factor. And so, hey, come to my breakout and you'll learn all about them. Um, but Faith communities are ideally situated, right, to recognize the trauma in people as we're all broken, especially Lutherans. We are at the same time sinner and saint at all times, right? We've all, we're all broken. Um, but just because someone has had adverse childhood experiences does not mandate they're going to reach for something else. Help them learn that they can reach for another person, right? Amen. Um, so this is a big part of prevention science, right? Is just recognizing trauma-informed yeah. care. But this isn't, this isn't a sentence. It's a tool. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. Over here? Yeah. Maybe this is loud enough. Two things. Yeah. Uh, can you enlighten us? Hang on, Bob. We've got online people that want to Oh, my bad. So uh, being uh, born in Minnesota and proud of it, um, okay. uh, are you, are you going to enlighten us on what chat TBDT is, or are you going to keep us in the dark? <laughs> and secondly, um, uh, apologies for prying, but your experience yeah. of breaking down. Oh, yeah, sure, I do, um, yeah. Thank you. Why, how, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be, not because I'm a voyeur, but because I think we all break down. No, no, I'm, I'm so thank you for asking, grateful you asked that, because um, I meant to go into that. I was not trying, to, I'm very open, uh, as you can tell. Um, I had started the Timothy Initiative and then came, I started the Sober Truth Project. And, and part of running the Timothy Initiative for as long as we have, I mean, the budget started to get really high. And I mean, I, like I said, it's open-ended. And when people stay there longer, it just costs a lot of money. And, and I don't know if you know this, but people are not willing to give men, to men's recovery ministries. They feel like men should pick themselves up by their bootstraps and get back to giving to society. The pressure of trying to, you know, I had a $350,000 a year budget. Um, meanwhile, I was making, you know, my last year I made some money, but the entire time I ran the place, I never made over $28,000 a year. I wanted to keep it going. So I wasn't in it for the money, and I want to be clear about that. But that, you know, I really felt called to the Sober Truth Project, and the Uncovery book was coming out. And I had appointed a brand new board of executive board of all business professionals, hoping they could take it into the next millennia. Well, even though I brought them on under one condition, they, they sort of changed and they didn't want me doing the other things. And it became this pressure of like, you know, and then I still got all this, my own trauma of like, I was brand new in recovery when I started it. So how much of my identity was tied into it? Who am I without it? 
and Q English was up here and she talked about her own life and how she was very successful and then one day she had a breakdown because a little girl was knocking on her door and it reminded her of her own childhood, how nobody cared for her. And she's like, I had to take a step back from my career and that's okay. And it just rocked me. And I just realized I had, I had already had the meeting set to meet with my board. They had already called the meeting. I knew everything was falling apart. But she said that and I just stood up and I just started weeping and I'm like, I'm that guy, I'm in this moment. And I literally went back and um, walked away from everything. Um, I lost everything. I walked, I mean, I'm still part of the ministry because the ministry's the men, the board, I don't even talk to. Um, they, they're like, we can't give you anything, you're, you're gone. And, uh, I, my last day with the ministry was officially, you know, October 15th, and they paid me on November 4th for that. So it was literally a year ago. And it was right here. And her words gave me what I needed to, to just feel the courage to go home and be like, it's a highly successful, highly regarded ministry, especially in Florida, and I'm walking away into nothing. And believe me, everybody asks, well, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. Like, so, there, well, did you relapse? No, I didn't, but even if I did, like, no. Like, I, I, just, I just couldn't go on. And it, the pressure of trying to keep something going beyond the grace of God had gotten to me. And I was suicidal and wanting to, you know, I didn't want to relapse as much as die. And, and I knew it was time to go. Thank you for asking. Chat CBD. Chat CBD. <laughs> ChatGPT is this amazing world-changing thing which I'm blown away that nobody here has heard of it. Um, it can literally create business plans, it can write books, it can do anything in, just put it in and say, do this for me, and it, it's, check it out. I highly recommend it. Before we leave, I need all of you to try ChatGPT. GBT. GB, GBT. Chat GBT. Yeah. It's not, Please try it. It's not CBD. No, not CBD. <laughs> not CBD. <laughs> to clarify, I'm Otto Schultz and I'm from Nebraska. Proud of it. And uh, Chat GBT specifically is artificial intelligence. It is a large language model. Yes. So it knows usually what words are to follow the words that you've put into it. And sometimes it's really stupidly wrong. <laughs> but mostly it's amazingly good and helpful in just, the way, just the way yeah. that George described, yes. Yeah. But it is specifically a large language model. Put it this way. And it's available on OpenAI. You can the, go in there right the now and say, I'm a 38-year-old heroin addict um, with, give it a couple other determining factors and say, write out a recovery program for me. And within seconds, it will have one. And it'll be, it'll be a start. It'll be a start. Um, I believe that you can actually use it as a chat function on a lot of recovery websites currently um, to help with things, um, especially now that it's actually tied into the internet. You get a sermon that way? <laughs> Ironically, no, it's funny. Do you guys have pub theology? The Lutherans have pub theology. Part of the bar pub theology back home was on that very thing. Should a pastor be able to use AI to write a sermon? Hi, I just wanted to thank you for like everything you've shared, for your books, for your story. I love the fact that you bring science into it and you're asking the question what happened to you not what's wrong with you because mm -hmm. that yeah. really is what we need to do especially yeah. <laughs> for those yeah. of us who believe in in our lord and savior i wanted to share something super cool that i realized just recently um, the National Institutes of Health have announced that oxytocin is a potential treatment for drug addiction. Did you hear that? Yeah. And this, this is, goes hand in hand with what you're saying. Do you know how oxytocin is naturally produced? 
through connection. It's been thought to release oxytocin, the love chemical most closely associated with longer term bonding and commitment. Yep. 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 So you don't need a drug. No. <laughs> you need community. You need community. Yeah. Which is kind of what concerns me about this post-COVID world because people are not gathering in community like yes. they used to. And so I think it's going to lead to some real... It's going to lead to more long-term situations, yeah. I wanted to let you know, um, in portion of your uh, talking, I wrote down, he's authentic. Well, thank you. Which is, I think, the root of um, the power of what you're doing here. I wanted to ask about, uh, early on, you were talking about how do we recover if all we do is hang out with addicts or people in recovery, but then it seems maybe the key to your Timothy project is this community of people in recovery. No, and it's actually community with every... We actually try to be part of communities that are not in recovery. And I wasn't very, I didn't do a very good job of telling that part of the story. The men live in recovery, but we bring them, we have a, a larger surrounding people that are not in recovery. They're, as Paul would say, don't present a stumbling block. So people are sober, they don't drink. They've agreed for the weaker brother to not drink, but be part of churches and organizations that are not in recovery so that they can feel whole. I, part of my usual talk is too often, you know, in addiction, the church puts us in the basement on a Sunday night, right? Sunday night because, well, all the church people went home by then. I've been part of churches that they, they don't let the people in recovery, the program, sit with the rest of the congregation, right? So there's an issue with all that, right? So... Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling we could keep going here. Um, we do need to... Hey, one, could you give okay, it his, yeah. though? Yeah. One more. Thanks. <clears throat> Mike Scott with Recovery Cafe out in Seattle. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate when you asked us all to raise our hands uh, because our founder, Killian, says we're all, we all are in recovery or can choose to be from anything that blocks our capacity to love. Yes. And that's what I also feel you're saying is yes. because in our essence, I think we are love. I yes. don't think we are broken, you know, we are, love. We, we are, we are love and we are part of love Amen. and to give people communities of healing and belonging mm -hmm. is what we need to do because yes. the community itself is healing. Yes. And you might need a few things like come to recovery circle every week, which we do. Uh, help clean the tables, which we asked everyone to do, and for everyone's sake, be be drug and alcohol free for 24 hours because we need this cafe to be a safe space. But otherwise, all are welcome here. Yes. And if you come to, and you, the person at the door who knows you, and you are known and loved, that's one of the things we say is recovery circle allows you to be known and loved, Amen. and that everyone in the space has at least a few people who know and love you, Yes. you want to come back. Yes. So I just think your model is beautiful, and that's what we are trying to do too at Recovery Cafes. Yes. So I'd love to have a chance to talk to you more about what, what we're doing yeah. um, at, recovery, at Recovery Cafes. Yep. So thank you for yep. your, your ministry. Absolutely. Thank you. Can we say thanks to George one more time? Thank you, George.